Thanks for staying with us on TV Cities. We're following developments from Britain, a nation in mourning after the death of Queen Elizabeth II at the age of 96. Buckingham Palace announced shortly after 6.30 p.m. that the monarch had died peacefully at her summer home, Bamora, in Scotland. Her son and heir has ascended the throne and will be known as King Charles III. His wife, Camilla, is the Queen Consort. The Union Jack is flying at half-mast and a 10-day period of mourning has been announced. Your palaces in London, Windsor and Bamora have seen huge numbers of people laying flowers and expressing their sadness at the passing of a much-loved queen who was on the throne since 1952. And the new King of England, Charles III, has led tributes to his mother in his words. Uh, court will mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms, and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world. And court. In the words of British Prime Minister Lee Strauss, it's the passing of the second Elizabethan age. The death of Her Majesty the Queen is a huge shock to the nation and to the world. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. She ascended the throne just after the Second World War. She championed the development of the Commonwealth from a small group of seven countries to a family of 56 nations spanning every continent of the world. Through thick and thin, Queen Elizabeth II provided us with the stability and the strength that we needed. She was the very spirit of Great Britain and that spirit will endure. Minister Liz Truss there. The death of the Queen Elizabeth II has generated reactions from all parts of the world. For President Joe Biden, the 96-year-old monarch charmed everyone with her weight, moved with her kindness. And French President Emmanuel Macron says the Queen will be remembered as a friend of France and a kind-hearted Queen. For German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, uh, paying tribute to the longest seven monarch in his words, she will be missed, not least, her wonderful humour. A service to Canadians was also acknowledged by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Prime Minister Trudeau says her efforts will forever remain an important part of the country's history. And Labour leader Keir Stem uh, says the Queen's life of service will be treasured. It was a Black Thursday as Queen Elizabeth II, the UK's longest seven monarch, died at Bamora at the age of 96 after reigning for 70 years. Senior rose had gathered at the Scottish estate after concerns grew about her health. Born on the 21st of April 1926 in Mayfair, London, she married Prince Philip in November 1947. Her first son Charles was born in 1948, followed by Princess Anne in 1950, Prince Andrew in 1960, and Prince Edward in 1964. The Queen had eight grandchildren and 12 great-grandchildren. She became Queen in 1952 and was crowned in 1953 as a Queen. Queen Elizabeth II appointed 15 Prime Ministers, including Listras. She also met 15 U.S. presidents, excluding Lyndon Johnson. Queen Elizabeth II reformed the monarchy for the less differential age, engaging with the public through royal visits and attendance at public events. 
A commitment to Commonwealth was constant. She visited every Commonwealth country at least once. She promised to devote her life to service. All the Queen's children traveled to Bamura near Aberdeen after doctors placed the Queen under medical supervision. As Song King Charles III said, the death of our beloved mother was a moment of great sadness for him and his family and that her loss will be deeply felt around the world. He will be leading the country in mourning as a new king. It is indeed the end of an era. These are images from Buckingham Palace as residents troop in to pay their last respect to Queen Elizabeth II, who died this afternoon. For my major contestant in the UK, Nim Zobong, joins us uh, on the news for more on this. All right, let's speak with um, broadcast journalist Tete Kofi, who joins us uh, live from London for more updates on the Queen's demise. Mr. Kofi, thank you for joining us on the news tonight. Always a pleasure to join TVC. Absolutely. Uh, 70 years is a long time to be a queen. You have to be way above 70 to uh, perhaps have an idea of what the English monarchy was outside Queen Elizabeth II. How uh, her father, King Edward VI, became king after his brother abdicated the throne. Precisely talk to us what the mood is like in London amongst those who have known her as queen all their lives? Two things I'd, I'd remark on. Um, it was 70 years and 214 days, which makes it seven years longer than the other long-lived monarch who was the Empress Victoria. Uh, secondly, there is a paradox around bereavement um, because the longer a person is alive, of course, the more you realize that they may depart at any time. But of course, the longer they stay with you, the more the idea of her departure becomes unbearable and intolerable. And of course, while every bereavement is difficult to bear, there is nothing as devastating as the bereavement by a mother. So London's mood is subdued. Um, it surprised me. Um, I uh, went out to Buckingham Palace and I saw the crowds uh, gathering very, very rapidly. And the mood was, I would say, subdued. I have friends who called me from pubs and places of entertainment where they were. And there were kind of one minute, two minute silences, followed by cheers for the Queen. So it, you get the sense that this lady was the invisible glue that held this kingdom together. And we will now know what the United Kingdom is going to be missing um, after her demise. Talk to us about her relationship with the African continent. She was in Kenya when she learned about the father's demise and also uh, the role she's played with uh, many British colonies that are now members of uh, the Commonwealth of Nations. Uh, how, how do you think that African countries are reacting to this time? You know, I, I have to kind of scan back to the very dim recesses of my memories as a child. And I know this, that uh, the Queen was very closely associated with the early independence leaders in Africa. So Kwame Nkrumah, Tafawa Balewa, uh, Julius uh, Nyerere, Milton Obote, Kenneth Kaunda, all of these people who were the first crop of African leaders post-colonial um, uh, independence um, were very, very close to the Queen. And she must have played the role of a massive diplomatic asset for the British government in all her dealings with the recently departed um, colonies. So her relationship with them was, was great. And it was important for the world of politics 
to have a back channel, if you like, where you had a figure who I think was genuinely trusted by these African and foreign leaders, sometimes I would say even more than the governments that were leading Queen Elizabeth's country at the time. So again, it's a major asset that's been taken off the chessboard for the United Kingdom. And this is without uh, diminishing in any way the, the age and experience of Prince Charles, who has watched all of this stuff progress through his life and will no doubt have by osmosis and um, his own experience and his own very extensive travels. I know Prince Charles has visited Ghana on several occasions. Um, if, but nothing beats the experience of the Queen, who was Queen longer than any of us on this program tonight have been alive. I, I was almost just going to ask, keep you way above 70 yourself, if you saw uh, what the monarchy was like outside Queen Elizabeth II, but you're saying that she's older than uh, both of us, so that answers the question. But talk right. to us about, you mentioned earlier about our being the glue that is keeping the monarchy together. I spoke with a Republican earlier on who mm -hmm. said it can't wait to see the monarchy give way to an elected president in the UK. What's, what's the popularity of the monarchy like right now uh, in the United Kingdom? You see, I mean, there are, there are two Britons. There is um, a very liberal, very progressive, very modern, and I would say generally rather younger Britain. And there is the older, I would say more traditional Britain. Um, I feel that there is still a majority of support uh, for the Queen, and it is only in times of political crisis that you see the value of the Queen, because we've had a lot of turmoil these past 20 years in British politics. And often, as a reporter, as a journalist, I've heard people say, can you imagine the trouble we'd be in? if the leader of this country was the leader of political party X, Y, or Z. And it's a rhetorical question because actually the truth is she was such a steadying influence that she was the figure that everybody would look to as a unifying force. And that impact on Britain's political life was absolutely undeniable. What was interesting was that Liz Truss, who is, with respect, only 47 years old, um, said that she called her the rock on which this country has stood um, for all of these years. And it's not hyperbole. It's not sycophancy. Um, it is actually a reflection of quite a basic truth that I think has run through British political life. Absolutely. Well, we'll see what the monarchy will become post Elizabeth Brain. Uh, broadcast journalist Tete Kofi, thank you for talking to us on the news tonight. Pleasure. Well, we're staying with development in the United Kingdom. We're joined now by former media contestant in the UK named Zubunge. He has details for us as regards the development in the UK. Talk to us about uh, what the reaction is to the news of the Queen's demise. Um, well, um, obviously, the Queen has been the only one we've known all of our lives. Um, most of us have um, watched the Queen um, lead this nation um, in the United Kingdom and act as a mentor to so many leaders across the world as a beacon of integrity and excellence. Um, I personally have had the privilege of meeting the Queen a number of times, and um, she was the one that actually honored me um, on the day I received an MBE from herself for services in the community. And I think that um, by the grace of God, she lived her rightful age. But I thank God, I believe her love 
for this nation and service kept her to the point that she was actually able to hand the government over to the Prime Minister Liz Probably we'll get back to uh, Mr. Bonga in the course of this bulletin. We're losing your audio very fast. Back in Nigeria, the National Executive Committee of the People's Democratic Party has passed a vote of confidence on the National Chairman, Senator Yucha Ayu, at the 97th meeting of the highest decision-making organ of the party. The former President of the Senate, Adolphus Wabara, has been appointed as the new Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the PDP. And this follows the resignation of Walid Jibrin as chairman of PDP Board of Trustees. Mr. Jibrin today announced his decision at a closed-door meeting of the BOT at the party's headquarters in Abuja. His resignation occurred amid agitation by the Southern Caucus of the PDP for the party's national chairman, Yocha Ayu, to step down for a southerner. While announcing his decision to step down, Mr. Jibrin said it's for the sake of the party's unity. Walid Jibrin has held the position for six years after taking over from Haliru Bello, who was removed in 2016. Which state has given more support than River State? Is anyone? Is anyone? The vituperations of River State Governor Yesom Wike seem not to have rattled the leadership of the People's Democratic Party as it passed a vote of confidence on the national chairman, Senator Iocha Ayu. I move this day on the 8th of September 2022 that a vote of confidence be put before the NWC for their doggedness, their forthrightness, and their professionalism. Iocha Ayu leaves to fight another day, as this certainly is not the end of a crisis that threatens to tear apart Nigeria's main opposition party. But the appointment of a new chairman of the Board of Trustees following the resignation of Senator Walid Jibrin is part of desperate moves to appease aggrieved members over perceived regional lopsidedness in the party's leadership. And I believe this party is as united as anything, uh, in spite of whatever impression other people may want to create. Anybody who is here can see the enthusiasm, the harmony in this party. The PDP will now continue its search for peace as campaigns ahead of the presidential election will start in the next two weeks. The presidential candidate of the PDP, Atiku Abubakar, who to a large extent appears unfazed by hurdles in his presidential race, is hopeful that the many troubles of the party will soon go away. It's true family disagreements are normal, even in normal families as well as political families. But what I can assure you is that we are determined to resolve those internal. And um, I can go to sleep and say that we are indeed going to make it come February 25th next year. And for us in PDP, we have the mechanism and we are working towards resolving all of those issues soonest. The PDP is still basking in the euphoria of his victory at the July 16th governorship election in Oshun State and hopes to replicate the same feat in next year's general election. Femi Akonde, CBC News, Abuja. State House correspondent Femi Akonde joins us live from Abuja for more on this development. Femi, just um, how resolved would you say the PDP issues are after this meeting? Sorry, Lee Femi, I can't hear you. In, if the issues within the People's Democratic Party are anywhere near resolved after the decisions made earlier today. Well, uh, I'm trying to make sense of what you're saying. I can't hear you well, but I believe you're asking if um, the PDP is near resolving uh, some of the issues within the party. Well, that is hard to say for now. If you're looking at uh, the 
outpost of the governor of River State, Yesom Wiki, and even the body language of the executive members of the party. We saw uh, the National Caucus meeting yesterday where some big wigs of the party shunned the meeting that had in attendance the presidential candidate, Atiku Abubakar. Most of the governors elected on the platform of the People's Democratic Party did not show up to that meeting. And this is an indication that all is not well within the party. It appears the party is still in deep water and the search for peace right now in the PDP is like looking for a needle in a haystack. And what we are hearing again now from the party as always, they are giving that assurance that they have what it takes to resolve all of these issues. But for now, that has not happened. We expected that at the end of uh, the National Executive Council meeting of the party that took place today, that we would hear some uh, far-reaching measures uh, put in place by the party to ensure that all aggrieved members are brought on board and uh, peace is restored to some extent. But that appears not to be the case uh, for now. We hope in the, we believe in the coming days that efforts will still be made to placate uh, people like uh, the governor of River State, uh, Yeso Mwike, and other members of the party who are aggrieved uh, for some reasons, especially what uh, they have called the perceived lopsidedness in uh, the positions, uh, principal positions of the party. They say it appears it is tilted uh, towards um, the north. They are calling for a balance uh, in uh, the national uh, positions of the party. But that is yet to happen. And it appears as if that is the only criteria for peace in the PDP. Nifemi. State House correspondent Femi Akonde live for us in Abuja. In other news now, wife of the presidential candidate of the ruling All Progressives Congress, Senator Remy Tinobu, has met with the party's National Working Committee to fine-tune the campaign strategy for the women's wing of the party. She was accompanied by wife of the party's vice presidential candidate, Hajia, Hajia Nana Shatima. Correspondent Habida Lawa reports. There is renewed agitation for more inclusion of women in politics and governance in Nigeria. Watchers of political events in the country believe this is justifiable considering the low representation of women in elected political positions since the inception of the present democracy. To ensure that more women are included in politics and governance, some legislators recently called for reserved seats for women in the two chambers of the National Assembly. And also, um uh, Excellency. It is why the wife of the APC presidential flag bearer, Uluremi Tinubu, and the wife of the vice presidential candidate, Nana Shatima, are paying a visit to the party's national headquarters. They are here to intimate the party of the activities as the women wing of the campaign council. The incoming administration will do was to, is to consolidate on all the work that our president, President Muhammad Buhari, is doing. And I can tell you, I'm, I'm not a novice in government. We've been there working. I can assure Nigerians the good work and the foundation he has laid for any incoming administration. Commanding the delegation, National Chairman of the party, Abdullah Adamu, says women are the important drivers of any successful campaign. I want to assure you that whatever you come up with by way of plans to ensure maximum participation in the efforts that we will be making as National Working Committee of our Great Party, we will stand with you. We are not novice to this course. We have served diligently. I can tell you for the past 20 years, I've been contributing my quota to this nation. And um, I'll be finishing my term in the Senate, uh, in this um, Ninth Assembly. And you will see by the time I give my stewardship report, which is also in the making, Nigerians will be amazed the work and the contributions I've made. According to the Independent National Electoral Commission, party campaigns will kick start by 28th of September. Habib Alawal, TVC News, Abuja. There is still no response from Kaduna based cleric Sheikh Ahmed Gumi 48 hours after the arrest of his media aide, publisher Tukor Mamo. Operatives of the Department of State Services had on Thursday morning carried out a search on Mr. Mamo's Kaduna residence and office. 
Eyewitnesses say the operatives took away documents, phones and laptops. Lupe Assam has details. Many residents in Kaduna are waiting to see further developments following the arrest of Tukumamu, the lead negotiator of Kaduna kidnap train passengers. Mr. Mamu had on Tuesday been arrested by Interpol in Cairo and repatriated back to Nigeria. The Department of State Services, DSS, on Wednesday confirmed they were behind his arrest. Security experts add that Mamu will have to answer critical questions on ongoing investigations relating to some security matters in parts of the country. But in addition to his arrest and return, the DSS operatives also raided his Kaduna residence and office on Thursday morning. Beyond certain confirmations made, government and security officials have not been forthcoming about the development. The DSS is part of the government. The military is part of the government. And you said that the DSS said is a person of interest. If he's a person of interest to an arm of the, of the security agencies, and it's of interest to all, you basically answered your question while alluding to the fact that he has been arrested for something, something. But the important thing is, the man has been arrested for questioning. I think we should give the DSS time. Let them do their job. The guys has what has what matters to us. And that's what matters to you. It was gathered that the armed men of the DSS stormed his house in over 15 security vans. And after a painstaking search operation, eyewitnesses say they cutted away some items, including phones, laptops and documents. Mr. Mamu's role as negotiator for kidnapped victims had led to the rescue of over 40 train passengers kidnapped by gunmen on the 28th of March. To such persons and their family members, Mr. Mamu remains a hero. But the depth of his involvement has raised a red flag, and it seems the federal government and security agencies feel his link with assailants causing unrest in the nation is too close for comfort. It was also gathered that his wives, who were arrested together with him in Egypt, have been freed while two of his sons are still in the custody of Nigerian security agencies. Lupe Assam, TVC News, Kaduna. The official flagger for the Scales 3.0 COVID-19 vaccination campaign has kicked off within the Federal Capital Territory. Experts at the event believe this new approach will go a long way in ensuring that everyone everywhere across the FCT will be able to get access to the COVID-19 vaccine which in turn will help to improve the vaccination numbers. Health correspondent Kemi Balogo has details. We'll return with business news. The Nigerian government seems to be going into full throttle to ensure that more jabs get into more arms in order to achieve its 70% vaccination national target. It has been a long, difficult road trying to get citizens vaccinated, and efforts are still on to ensure that a large percentage of the population get the jab in order to achieve herd immunity. The government launched the Scales 3.0 strategy in August to accelerate integrated COVID-19 vaccination and to address the identified implementation gaps in ramping up coverage across the country. So this launch is simply to ensure that the implementation starts right from within the capital city. This strategy is meant to address the bottlenecks and other factors that made us not to achieve our desired target in the country. We start, we are, FCTA currently stands at 40% and we are hoping to achieve 70% by this October. We aimed at immunizing about 1.5 million uh, inhabitants of our FCT here. Unfortunately, we could not do that. But this is an opportunity for us to still meet up with that target. Yeah. So we, I urge everybody, not, not only in FCT, in the whole country, to be vaccinated against COVID. So I will remain safe. We want to achieve herd immunity, and it has to be achieved. Nigeria has so far vaccinated about 41 million people, representing about 36% of the needed number to achieve herd immunity. Communities remain key to helping this drive towards ramping up the vaccine campaign, starting from the community level. The traditional uh, institutions, 
we are always ready to partner with the authorities so that we can get our uh, members of the uh, community fully vaccinated at all times. It's meant to be administered both at the fixed post and wherever people walk or live. This is the new strategy. Experts are hopeful that this launch will not only achieve the 70% target, but it will exceed it in the FCT. Kemi Balogun, TVC News, Abuja.